you know, we talk about worship in heaven. Some, some people think, oh, like heaven's going to be so boring. Why would God do that? I mean, anything exciting and good here on earth is God has made. I mean, or God has allowed. And why would he, like the pinnacle of everything he's ever done, which is heaven, like why would that all of a sudden be a downer? I mean, this is just nothing. This is just the appetizer. But then some people think, oh man, I've got to go to church all the time. Well, whatever you feel during this moment, we don't get to feel very often now. But this times you know, off the wall, closeness to God, and our maker, you know, like is an experience of like, oh man, I can't wait, I, I want to go back and feel that more, and so don't ever think heaven's going to be a downer, and because, man, every now and then, we get moments like this on earth, just to remind us that just wait. <sighs> okay. All right, so we're kind of in a whispering mode. See, this is, this is an empty cup. I had a full one somewhere. We've gotten to where we don't like Christmas so much, and it's like, Oh, really? You got to start already this week on Christmas? Really? I mean, like all December long, we're going to sing music, Christmas music, and I am not ready. And the reason why we say we're not ready is because we got all the stuff that the world says we have to do to make it Christmas nowadays. We got all that stuff to do. And so, what has it done? is it's made a beautiful season which is meant to be like what we just experienced. It's made it stressful to where we just say, ugh, not already. No, they don't have their lights up already. And the Savior of the world never meant it to be this way, the way, the way we do it. If somebody would come to our country for the first time and didn't know anything about the Christmas story, we wouldn't say to them, just observe what goes on and you'll be able to tell what Christmas is about. But in a moment like this, when the world was going crazy and running around and scared, because the Romans were dominating the world, totally dominating the world when Jesus was born. And the, the Jewish people were getting treated awful by the Romans. And everyone's scared of the guy who's in charge, whose name was Caesar Augustus. He was the, he was the head guy, and he was the dominator, and he was the ruler, and he was the one that would crush your head if you got out of line. Is that kind of domination. The Romans, while they had their good parts, they had a lot of faults, and part of it was that they lived life crushing anybody who got in their way. And so these guys, this was, this was the thought. And now the world is fearful, and the world is loud, and the world is boisterous, and the loud world is hateful. And into the world when Jesus was born is all of that noise, and he comes whispering. 
like you just felt them a minute ago. And you can't feel that unless we're quiet enough to feel it. And most of the world didn't feel it because they're just, they're caught up in their anxieties and they're rushing around and all of that. So he comes in whispering to to better explain what I want to talk about today, I need to talk about the idea of hero as it was defined in Roman culture. Okay? And this will help us to, to, to start to understand how Christ came into the world as a different kind of hero that, that had ever been known before. And it'll help us to understand just this mindset of a whispering savior. So let's, let's work just for a moment on hero. This is the Roman way of looking at hero. And, and this part is similar to our definition. If somebody had superhuman achievements in life, they were a hero. We get that. But then the Romans would go a, a million steps further in this definition. Then they would say, when that hero died, the gods, they, were, they believed in literally thousands of gods. The Romans, one, th one of the things that they did was they conquered all types of people. And the nations that they would conquer, if those nations put up a good fight against them, they would think it's because the, the gods that those nations served were pretty strong. And so they would incorporate those gods into their worship too. And so they had thousands of gods. But they believed that when a hero died, that the gods would deify or make a god into that Roman hero once he died. So what they then would do is they would honor that hero at death with a haroon, which I'll show you in just a minute. It's a, it's a little building of worship to come and gather and honor and worship that Roman hero who has become a god. And one of the reasons why they would worship that hero is because now that that hero is a god, he can pull some strings for the Romans. Now, if we honor him, he can do some good things for us because he's a god, and we need good crops, and we need you know, plenty of wealth or whatever. He will help us in that. So we will honor our hero by building a room which looked like this and these were all over in the Roman Empire as the years would go on and we'll, we'll be developing this thought just remember this I'll show it to you a little bit later we'll come back to it but all of this goes right in with Roman type of thinking. And, and by the way, the reason why we focus, you know, a lot of times you hear me talking about the Hebrews, it's because um, Jesus is Jewish. And for us to really understand Scripture, we have to understand the Jewish way of thinking and the Hebrew way of thinking. But then sometimes we talk about Romans because now when Jesus was born, the world was dominated by Romans and Roman thinking. So we also, we need to know how the Jews were thinking, but we also need to know about Roman thinking. And Roman thinking is always interesting because it is what we have adopted in our Western world. We think like Romans in our world. We've adopted the Western style of thinking and living. So, here's typical Roman thought. 
Live your life to make it to the top. Uh, Regardless of how you get there, regardless of who you have to step on, who you have to offend, your goal is to make it. If you're going to be successful, you have to make it to the top of whatever area you are in in life. That's a success. Sound familiar? Now, the guy who is at the top, who had made it all the way to the top, I mean the top, in Roman life when Jesus was born was a ruler named Caesar Augustus, and he was at the top. Caesar Augustus was the ruler on the throne of the Roman Empire, which was incredibly vast. Caesar Augustus, if I, meant, if I said it wrong, I don't know, if did I say Julius? Caesar, Caesar Augustus. Julius was uh, his, he, he is the stepson to Julius Caesar. And I'll explain the screen to you in just a second, but so Caesar Augustus is the stepson to Julius Caesar, and when Julius Caesar died, there happened to be an, an interesting thing that you can find in recorded history. There was a comet uh, that was seen in, in that part of the world about a month after Julius Caesar died. And the word began to spread that that comet was the sign of Julius Caesar, a hero, becoming deified, becoming a god. And since Caesar Augustus was his son, Caesar Augustus began to say, I am the son of a god. I am the son of Julius Caesar. He is a god. I am a god. And so when he came to power, which was about 27 years before Jesus was born, and then he was still in power when Jesus was born, he began to call himself the Savior of the world. Because in his mind, he brought peace to Rome, he brought a better economy, he brought whatever it might be to Rome, and so he was their Savior, is how he promoted it. And... The best way in that day to try to get your propaganda across to the people was to put it on a coin because they didn't have media like we did. They couldn't, they couldn't put it on Facebook or something like that. So the best way to get the word out that you want to get out is by putting it on a coin because coins travel. And the coins traveled to all parts of the Roman Empire. And so on that coin is his picture, his name on the left, and then a Latin phrase, divi, with the uh, initial F. F means Phileas. His his actual name was, was Phileas Augustus. So that's F. The divi is a Latin phrase which means son of a god. So he puts this on the coin, which goes all around the Roman Empire. And by the way, just for interest's sake, his legal name is Long. This is what he legally called himself. Now imagine if you're buying a home and you have to put this like 20 times on the paperwork, you know. Emperor or Imperator, which uh, means the... Uh, The commander of the republic, it means the emperor, the guy in charge, as high as you can get in an earthly human sense. He was that guy. Imperator, Caesar, Phileas, son of a god, Augustus. That was actually his title, his name. He called himself that. And uh, one of the the monuments that um, has been discovered in history uh, you can even see some of this wording, and, and it's just highlighted on this. No way. Like, wow. That must have been you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So one of the monuments that's uh, discovered has this kind of wording on it, and in this picture, um, it's, this picture has the, some of the key wording highlighted. So the IMP is imperator or emperor, which means he's, the, he's in the highest position that a human being can be in, Caesar, and then there's the Divi, son of a god. So again, he is saying that, that he's the highest you can be as a human being, plus he is divine. He is son of a god. Now, think back. Roman way of thinking is to get to this point as a Roman. And for anybody to get to this level of being the Caesar, you had to crush a lot of people. And there was a lot of bloodshed in this guy's life. He had to step on a lot of people. He had to do ruthless, ruthless things. To scream at everybody, I am the imperator. I am the dominant one. I am the head. I am. I am. And you better not say I'm not because I'll crush you. I am the dominator. I am Caesar. And so if you remember the picture, I'll show you again but in a minute, but if you remember that picture, steps going up and then he's elevated in worship. So he was, he was kind of nothing. He was actually adopted into the household of Julius Caesar. He was kind of nothing. And he fights and he steps and he slashes and he's, he just demands and conquers his way up to the top. That's a hero in Roman life. Caesar Augustus. So we go into Scripture and it says, In those days... Caesar Augustus. This is in Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Surrey. We don't know anything about Quirinius. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child who was the Savior of the world. Uh, who was the savior of the world. And he is born at a time where this other guy has fought and slashed and lied and killed and dominated his way to the top and demanded that he be called savior of the world and demanded that he be thought of fully human and fully divine. The Savior of the world is quietly born at the same time. Now, I say that he is an upside-down hero. Why? Because a hero in Roman days was, as I've been saying, you start at the bottom and you fight your way to the top and then you demand to be worshipped and recognized. This Savior started not there, but at the top and worked his way down to our level so that he could save the world. Now, both were powerful. Herod was powerful in his way of killing people and maiming people and shouting at people all to the top. But he wasn't trying to save the world. He was trying to save himself. 
And the real savior of the world starts here, and he comes here, and he was powerful, but not to save himself, but to save us. He's an upside down hero. And so later on, after his ministry on earth had, had been completed, there's a book in the Bible uh, called Philippians, written to a Roman city called Philippi. Philippi happened to have in it one of these Haruns. So they were fully aware of Haruns and, and that that represents a hero who started at the bottom and works his way to the top, dominating, and then, and then he demands to be worshipped. It was the uh, Harun of um, uh, Philip II, who was the, the father of Alexander the Great. And that was in Philippi. So they're fully aware. Now look at what Scripture says to them and to us in light of Romans who know what a hero is supposed to be and what they're thinking, in light of the fact that there's these, there are these Haruns and even one in their town, now he teaches us just briefly about relationships. And there's something key that we need to do relationally to make our relationships work better. So just quickly, another picture of here's the hero, Harun, in the... Roman way of thinking, you work your way up the top, then you demand to be worshipped, and one day you're worshipped, and so forth. And Philippians chapter 2, now in your relationships with one another, he's talking to every single one of us right here today, in, in my relationship with all the people I have relationship with, in your relationship with all the people you have relationship, you have you are supposed to have, we need to have, as followers of Christ, his mind set. Mindset means an intentional way of thinking. Every action that we do starts in the mind. So it's an intentional way of thinking about life. It has to be intentional because it's not the normal way that we think. But to have as good a relationships as we possibly can, where we start is with the mindset of Jesus that we're going to see here in just a moment. And I believe it's connected with these Haruns and all of this thing of the Roman way of thinking of being a hero, fighting your way to the top. Talking about Jesus now, going on in verse 6, says, Jesus, being in very nature God, this is... This is where one of the places where the Bible just flat out says Jesus is God. Jesus. Being in very nature God. Did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. You know what that's saying? It's saying that even though Jesus was God, he did not insist on being treated like God. Because he was out to save the world. He was out to do something else, bigger. Now, Caesar Augustus demanded on being treated like, you know, I demand you treat me like this, and, and I demand you treat me like God, and if you don't, I'm gonna, you're going to pay for it. Well, this is saying Jesus did not feel like he had to do that, even though he was. So... Caesar Augustus starts down here, fights his way to the top. Jesus starts up here and begins to come down, upside down hero. See, down. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. See, Jesus steps down. The rune steps up. Jesus is stepping down, making himself a servant, being made in human likeness. After being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death 
on a cross. You cannot go any lower than that. So the plan of Jesus is not like the heroes of the Roman days where you start down here and you're nothing and you fight and you dominate and you demand your rights and that people treat you this way so that you can fight your way up to the top. Jesus was at the top and he comes down to the bottom so much that he willingly dies. can't get any lower. So that he could be a hero, interesting kind of hero, a whispering hero, a upside down hero. And look what happens. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place there, and he's exalted to the highest place And gave him the name that is above every other name. And now we are here to worship the name not of Caesar Augustus, but of Jesus who worked his way down to nothing and has been exalted to the point that we sing about his name. A whispering Savior, a upside down Savior, because down here is where you change the world. Not up there. Demanding to be worshipped, demanding to have every right, demanding to have the red carpet rolled out everywhere you go. Down here is where you change the world. And what is the mindset of Jesus that is saying we all must have? A servant mindset. A mindset that doesn't demand. How does the love chapter go in 1 Corinthians? Love does not insist on its own way. A mindset that, that is interested in the bigger picture, not the picture that starts with me and ends with me. The bigger picture that we are here for a purpose. We are here for a reason. We are here to change the world through the whispering Savior that is inside of us. And so our life predominantly should not be that of shouting and yelling and shaking our fists and demanding and saying, you need to treat me this way. And instead, it's as a humble servant. Oh, I'm not talking about being walked on. I'm not talking about being abused. I'm not talking about um, your personality being taken away. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about a a silent kind of power, God working in us, where we keep our personality, we keep our dignity. We're not being, you know, abused by people or things like that going on, no. But we look first to serve in power and strength in every relationship. This is the Jesus way. So if you're, in a, if you're married, you're in a relationship with, you are there to serve Husbands, you are there to serve your wife. And wives, you are there to serve your husband. It is not a gender thing. It's a Jesus thing. And of all the marital uh, relationship advice that I could give anybody, you know, where it all starts is serving. Where you, you're, you look how you can serve your wife today, men. Because that's what Jesus would do. And you'll find a lady who would love to serve you. You be a leader first the leader like Christ, and you serve your wife. Um, be a lady that is honored to be in love with you. And at work, we are servants, regardless of our position. And it's not 
we need to work at, at you know, fighting off this thought of, you know, I'm like, I'm just like being treated so bad and they work me so many hours. Well, we might be treated bad at work, but it could be different if we look at it as we are, we are there to serve with the power of Christ. And if we take the personal feelings out of it, like they're treating me so bad, so this is an opportunity to try to serve my Jesus and to be Jesus to them. It can make a whole different outlook of work and the relationships that we have at work. That person that's bothering you at work, if you could look this week at trying to serve them, uh, there could be a wonder of difference. Parents to children, serve them. Oh, I'm their parent. Well, Jesus, remember? Because he could have pulled that too. He could have said, I'm their God. Children, serve your parents. Every relationship must have the mindset of Jesus, and that's where the beginning of health comes. We are a small group of people, but we are going to serve this community and this world, and we are already making a difference. We're not here to be served by the community. We're not here for whatever reason, to be recognized or for whatever reason else. We are here to be Jesus and to serve this community, this world. It's all about loving God, loving each other, and loving our community. Okay, quick question. What relationship in your life could be improved with a new mindset?